Welcome to e-commerce marketing with the Pitbulls, where we catch up with craft brands to hear their story and learn how they're growing their e-commerce channel. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Lindsay. And today we're joined by Kuljit Rakra. He is the co-founder of Takasa, um, a certified organic fair trade uh, bed linens uh, brand. So Kuljit, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Um, could you take a second, just kind of introduce uh, yourself and Takasa? Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, how you founded the brand and and your story up to this point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so myself, I am a, a former banker, uh, now reformed uh, into a um, you know social and environmentally uh, friendly entrepreneur. Uh, we, my wife and I, founded Takasa. Uh, um, in 2020, uh, we actually launched um, March 3rd, 2020, uh, about a week before the pandemic and the world shut down. Um, so it's quite an interesting time to uh, launch a brand. Um, you know, we had to throw all of our business case assumptions out the window uh, mm-hmm. and sort of just start over again. Um, but yeah, we started the business basically because a few years before we had started a, a home renovation um, and we looked at, you know, the things that we were buying and the things that we were using and seeing their impact on both the environment and the people making them. And uh, we sort of fell, you know, we, we looked into bed linens, we looked into our living room, because those are the biggest or longest uh, sort of time that we spend. So we spend like most of our time in the living room, or we spend most of the time in the bedroom. And we thought, what are some things that are in those two rooms that we can, you um, change to make sort of the environment better and our lives better as well um and that's where you know the bed linens came in and then uh we noticed that there weren't that many options in canada um so there were a few options out in the u.s some really big brands but in canada there wasn't really much here uh and so we saw the gap um and and we decided to pursue um takasa and we created canada's first organic and fair trade certified homewares brand um, so we do bed linens, we do bath linens, and uh, in the future, we hope to get all the way into like people's food, um, so organic farming, as well as homes and creating like sustainable homes as well. That's awesome. Tell me, I'm really interested, um, kind of coming from that story, and, and we were uh, very similar, the PPC Pitbulls, we started right around the same time, but of course, everything we do is all kind of service-based, so we're we're here, like, you know, kind of supply chain was never really an issue did you did that? How did that impact you, or how did that um, you know? Right as you're coming out of the gate, trying to figure out how you're going to sustainably soar, especially you know, keeping it sustainable. Um, how were you impacted by kind of everybody shutting down at the same time? Yeah, it was quite um, sort of. There are some positives and some negatives, right? So the positive side, although we launched March 2020, we had started sort of working on the business in 2019, and, and luckily all of our stuff arrived arrived in February of 2020. So we had stock, we had everything here. So our first run of products um, was normal for for the most part. Um, And then when we had to reorder, that's when supply chain issues came up. So um, the demand for organic and sustainable and fair trade cotton went through the roof. And so we saw our cotton prices go up. Um, And then the time to get those products went from about um, five months to about nine months, and in some cases a year. So we had to order far in advance. And not only that, you know, container prices went up. Uh, and we like to sort of bulk buy so that we fill a container uh, and bring it in and that makes sure sort of there's no contamination or anything else with our products. Um, so you add all those costs together and it, and it ended up really like impacting our cash flow because all of a sudden a, you know, four or $5,000 container was $20,000. Um, so things that we didn't forecast that we had to forecast and then, um, deal with. Yeah, that's amazing. And then did you get over before kind of, as you were going through this, were you out with your suppliers in person or, um, you know, prior to that, how did, how did you go through kind of the sourcing decision? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, prior to sort of picking the two main factories that we use, we actually, I, I went out to India, I visited eight factories, um, and sort of made sure that 
the claims we're making are true, right? So making sure that they, um, you know, that the facilities are clean, the employees are not being mistreated, uh, making sure that the the cotton they're using is actually fair trade cotton and certified organic. So we we do rely on third parties to audit them, but I wanted to go in person and see them. So yeah, in in you know, I was able to in 2019 go out, visit all the factories, meet the owners, uh, meet the workers, uh, which was a great experience. That's awesome. Probably in some ways, very fortunate timing, right? You kind of got in under the wire there, figured out all your sourcing and then, you know, kind of uh, 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 responding to that demand. It was, you know, at that point, not like anybody could form new supplier relationships because it was just everything was so shut down. Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of good things happened before and good things after. So it's, it's fortunate timing. Yeah. I want to ask about the process of getting organic and fair trade certified. What does that look like? And was it like an arduous task to do? Yeah, surprisingly, it's arduous and expensive. Um, so the one, ed- so part of it is um, the certifying bodies um, want to make sure that, you know, from the seed all the way to final delivery, that everything meets their criteria. That includes like our packaging, that includes like cardboard inserts. Um, they want to make sure we're using other, you know, um, FSC certified paper. They want to make sure we're not like, you know, they come out to our facility. I mean, I have a nice background right now, but behind me are a bunch of shelves. Uh, so they come out and they check everything. They make sure we have employee handbooks. They make sure that we're following all the local laws. Um, so there's a lot of work involved, like, you know, countless um, hours of paperwork and then in on-site uh, inspections. Were you prepared for that when you got into looking into those certifications? Did you already know ahead of time that it was going to be the process that it was, or were you surprised by the process? Yeah, no, I wasn't. So uh, fortunately, it's a really small community um, in terms of the number of companies that are certified. And so I was able to reach out and talk to a few companies that had been certified. Um, and just, you know, some of them are very open and they just sort of said, let's sit down and talk about this. They sent me their plans, uh, which was very helpful um, and told me what to expect. Um, and, and so that's good because the community is kind of small. So when people come to me, I, I offer the same type of advice as well and say, hey, this is what we had to do. Here's the best way to do it. Um, just because like, I, you know, I don't see it as competition. I just see it as like more people getting involved in fair trade and more people getting involved in organic just means it's better for everyone, right? I love that perspective from a business. It's not about the competition. It's about making sure we're all being as sustainable as possible. And since we do share community, yeah. I really love that. Yeah. yeah. The pie gets bigger, not smaller. Right. So like, I, and you know, as, as the pie gets bigger, everyone's share gets bigger. So. Yeah. I think we, we support a lot of brands in uh, CPG space too. And they have kind of that very similar community feel where it's like, it is competitive, but I think more than anything, it's, it really feels like a community and everybody is very willing to kind of help each other out. It's really cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so let's uh, kind of dig into some of the marketing side, especially knowing that you're a bootstrap brand, kind of you know built this on your own. I'm very curious to hear. Um, we're always interested in kind of digging into some of the ways that you can build a brand, you know, maybe without a ton of you know funding behind you or or you know some some kind of massive investment. So uh, I know you had mentioned before we we hopped online that you kind of started out with affiliate. Um, tell us a little bit about that and kind of what brought you down that path and and how you started there. Yeah, so um, we didn't completely start an affiliate. We started, um, but our major sort of um, source of traffic right now is affiliate. Um, I wish we had learned about it earlier. That's my number one advice when people come to me for uh, um, sort of, hey, I'm starting a business. What should we do? And if you're selling goods, um, a good thing to do is sign up for one of the affiliate programs like Share a Sale or you know, Refersion or something like that to get in there. Um, and mainly because, and we focus mainly on press um, and bloggers versus influencers or um, customer-based affiliate programs. And that's mainly because, you know, as a new brand, you want to get word out there and you want to get that credibility that is, you know, lends itself when you get a newspaper or a magazine publishing about you. Um, and then you also get their little cool little like logo on your webpage thing as seen in um so yeah, we we started off, uh, you know, once we learned about uh, this whole affiliate program, it made our press outreach so much easier as well. 
um, because a lot of these articles that we see out there are sort of, hey, how do we make money because we're not advertising anymore? Let's do the affiliate. So every click and a purchase results in some sort of kickback to the publishers. That's really interesting. I hadn't really thought of it with that take, but you know, knowing kind of that PR piece is so big, but having the affiliate set up before you get started with all that just makes it that much easier to get get you know, into yeah. these different publications. We, we spent the first yeah, we spent the first six months like pitching, 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 and like getting very, very little um, like airtime, and then you know, bumped upon this like share a sale and skim links and then we're like oh we're on this now and then all of a sudden all the publishers are like oh, okay we'll publish you now we'll add you to our list of call we'll talk about you um you know you want to sort of be fair as well right you want to try to um share in the good uh and that's part of it as well right so we can't afford as a small brand to spend 5k on a magazine article or a magazine um, publication but if we're going to offer them a little commission on any sales that they get, then it sort of works out for both of us. Gotcha. <clears throat> is that all set up through something like a, a share sale as far as like the actual logistics of it? Um, and, you know, publishing a separate link for them or for each individual publication? Yeah, there's a, a multiple ways of doing it, but share sales probably in our opinion, like the easiest way to do it. And, you know, you sign up, a lot of the publications um, use a program called Skim Links, which basically is automated. Um, once you get onto ShareSale, you can add Skim Links as an affiliate, and that basically allows almost any publication to mostly sign up for Skim Links um, okay. to sort of any they send to your site. It automatically calculates it and says, "Hey, this is on affiliate, and you'll get some commission from it." Um, but there are a couple, more than a couple, a few. Uh, publishers that we work directly with and have customized rates for them. Gotcha. Did you have any issues with kind of, you know, data sharing and trying to figure out kind of, um, you know, I guess contractually, like how you set that up to make sure, you know, I, I, I haven't worked a ton in affiliate, but I would guess yeah. that, you know, I really the publication is more at risk there of, you know, making sure that you're giving them your, your data back. Yeah. Um, with, you know, there's with ShareSale, there's a bit of code that you put into your site and there's an app that gets added in um, that helps with the tracking. It's not perfect because if someone's private browsing or anything else, like sometimes it just doesn't come through. Um, but you do your best to, to, you know, to track as best as possible and allow ShareSale to sort of do its job. Gotcha. That's cool. Um, and it sounds like you have also done some SEO work in Google Ads. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing on Google Ads. Yeah, so Google Ads, um, we are, you know, doing well. We were doing shopping ads, and we were doing search uh, and branded search, and then uh, Performance Max came about about a year ago, and we started on that, and have been. Um, that's sort of our number one sort of performer at the moment is uh, Performance Max. Um, we recognize that a lot of it's probably uh, retargeting uh, our existing customers. Um, but at the same time, you know, it works. So it's not like I'm going to be turning it off um, or, or switching things up. We try as best as possible to maximize for new customers. Um, but we can clearly see when we send out an email um, that these customers are being retargeted at that same time. And then sales go up whenever we send out a campaign. So. Yeah. We kind of always kind of have that in the back of our heads, right. Is, is you never quite know are these new customers or not, but one of the piece of advice yeah. I always give is like, well, as long as you're continuing to push spend, if you're putting more spend in and continuing to kind of scale and get get your know, purchases in at a similar result level, at a certain point, the existing customers are going to run out. So, like, kind of the uh, yeah. you know, pushing that to its scale limits kind of solves that problem a little bit. Obviously, it's still um, yeah. you have to kind of know what you're doing and use some some rules of thumb to hopefully kind of adjust for some of those factors. But, yeah. um, you know, was, you know, at a certain point, if you're really scaling those results up, it's not all existing customers. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you do have to adjust and you have to watch out for it and see how your cost per acquisition is moving on a weekly basis, just to make sure. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of benefits in sort of the automated part of uh, Performance Max, especially for like, you know, a team of two, like we are at Takasa. So it's, it's, it makes things easier, right? Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, sometimes it's uh, keep it simple, stupid, right? And just you can't overcomplicate it. <laughs> yeah. Get the get the setup in there and and see and work with it. I'd, yeah, I'd love to ask too, but since you're a smaller team, when it comes to the creative aspects of Performance Max, was that something exciting for you all when you do- dove into it, or was that a little bit um, jarring to have to add in all of these, you know, videos and images and logos to your search campaigns now instead of just regular text search? Yeah, no, we we don't mind that because we um, the the one the one of the things that we invested in was photography um, and videography. Um, you know, this is a lovely picture of a bed on a balcony out in BC. Um, so yeah, we we didn't have a problem with that creative aspect, and we found that it was quite easy to just add in um, the creative, and they automatically sort of crop it for you, and you can adjust it as needed. Um, and same thing with the video, you just sort of put in your YouTube videos and, um, you know, we had some, yeah, UGC videos. We had some other videos that we got created from, um, a third party that sort of worked out really well for us. How often are you refreshing some of that stuff? On the campaign side? I guess, yeah, both on the, you know, uh, uh, how often are you switching them out and and to kind of feed that, feed the beast, so to speak? How often are you going through kind of new shots and, and new uh, creative cycles? Yeah, so new shots, we'll probably add in, you know, basically after we do a photo shoot, we do a photo shoot every like six to eight months. Um, and then we'll add in those shots then and any videos that we get. If we get any really good sort of UGC videos or UGC um, pictures, we'll, we'll add those in as well. So it's not really a, it's not scheduled per se, um, but we do it as, as in when. Gotcha. Awesome. Is that seasonal, seasonally driven or not? Are you guys running like uh, seasonal promos through most of the stuff or I guess your betting is kind of evergreen, right? Yeah, it's evergreen. We basically, whenever we add a new color uh, or a new product, we do a photo shoot. And, and so that's when we'll, set up for um you know new creative awesome. we'd like to get into a that you know spring and fall type uh, um, schedule um and and we have that in our plan going forward but it's um you know it now that uh supply chains are back to normal maybe we can actually accomplish that yeah i feel like that's you know kind of going back to that keep it simple you know it feels kind of daunting right you got to get everything going, everything's got to stay super seasonal. You got to be producing creative all the time. But one of the the you know challenges with a small business is it's not necessarily completely scaled up. But one of the benefits there is it's it's not like you don't need to to get every last bit of juice out of the orange, right? It's like you can get a lot done with some of this evergreen stuff. And with, you know, every six months, every eight months photo shoots, you don't necessarily need to be, you know, going, yeah. going crazy on the, the hamster wheel of uh, content and creative. Yeah, but it does feel like you have to be, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, always, I, I always would, pressure. I would, uh, pressure to do more. Yeah, there's always pressure, but I'd always, I, you know, to any sort of solo entrepreneurs out there or small teams out there, not like, you know, listen to what you just said. You don't need to always be um, creating. It's um, you can recycle some of your own content because let's be honest, like, do you remember what someone posted six months ago? Exactly. Right? Probably not. <clears throat> do you remember what someone posted three months ago? Probably not. So, <laughs> It's okay to recycle your uh, your content. And you'll get to that point, right? I mean, like, it, it'll be very clear when the time comes that you need to be producing a little bit more quickly. But, you know, it's not when you're a two-person team, that's not the number one priority right now. So it's it's important to keep that in mind. Yeah. I think, too, another piece on that, it's interesting to kind of look at Google ads and Facebook ads and kind of differentiating. I, I think, you know, there's probably a much higher creative demand and probably much more space to scale on the the Facebook side. But um, that's one of the nice things about Google ads is, you know, it's probably not going to scale quite as far as you might be able to on meta ads in, in a lot of cases. But um, but yeah, some of those needs are a lot lower, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. I find um, depending on your budget, you can probably, you know, it'll take a lot for you to max out on Google. Um, yeah. It, right. To get to that phase where, okay, now we do need to add another channel in um, versus I think on the Facebook side, you can keep going. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and so like, you know, if, if you're a small business and your budget's less than 10 K, you can probably just focus on one channel and not need to spread yourself too thin. 
Um, maybe just, you know, like what we had set up was we were doing Google and then we had just retargeting on like Pinterest and Facebook. And that's all we had running on those ends. Um, and that sort of, that's worked for us so far. Yeah. I feel like that's a really good point. It's like, it's, it's all about kind of where your budget's at and kind of where you're, you're scaling again, you don't need to do everything all at once. I always like to ask, and granted, I understand too, for a lot of businesses that started right before COVID, the biggest answer is, well, I wish COVID didn't happen because then it would have made this a lot more simpler. But what are kind of some advice that you would give to the bootstrap brands that are kind of in the same position you were in? Um, what's some ups and downs you went through that you would like to share? Yeah, I think um, the biggest thing for me is focus. And I think um, for us, like we have bed sheets and we have towels and duvet covers. Um, the one thing that happened during COVID was I think it just added a little bit more time for us to do other things. And that was a distraction, right? So we added a baby line that was, you know, it, it started off successfully, then just died out. Um, and, and so we just have products sitting around and then we, you know, we did comforters and we started doing duvet inserts and pillows. And I think it was just all too much too quickly. Um, so what I would really say is focus, uh, and stay on your main products. And, um, that just helps you not overextend yourself because the biggest thing for, uh, bootstrapped is cash flow, right? And as you're adding more products, that's more inventory you have to hold and, you know, more customer expectations for you to have that inventory. So when you sell out of something, the customer's like, Hey, I wanted that blanket. And I'm like, well, we don't have it and I can't afford to get 50,000 more of these. So it's going to be a little bit longer, right? Um, so yeah, focus on your main products, focus on just driving, uh, as much efficiency as possible at the beginning and, and conserve cash. Love that. I mm-hmm. love that. You know, we, we find a lot of like, you know, single product lines or a couple SKUs, um, and kind yeah. of these, these brands almost going viral and kind of, you know, taking a particular industry by storm. Um, but yeah, it's, at the end of the day, you only need a couple SKUs to kind of start building the brand and the story. And yeah, at some point, you'll probably add to that and, and grow and scale, but um, doesn't need to be the first step. Yeah. What would you say is the biggest challenge you guys have faced or are facing now? Oh, man, um, so many challenges. Um, <laughs> I think the biggest one for us is really um, like managing our inventory at this point and managing our cash flow. Um, just because like, I feel like the first two years, you're sort of living off the initial sort of inventory that you had and sort of rolling that over. Then as you expand your product lineup, then it's starting and and you want to add more colors, then you're starting to look at, okay, um, you know, we have to pay 50% up front. Uh, we don't get the product for another six months and that cash is gone. We just have to make sure we have enough cash flow to keep running. Um, and as you're scaling and as you're getting bigger, you're starting to spend more money on ads and then you know you run out of boxes. So you have to order boxes, right? So all these things sort of add up um, and, and it puts a strain on cash flow. So I think the biggest challenge is cash flow. I'd love to know on the opposite side of that, what is like a big benchmark that makes you feel like, or a milestone that you've hit that you're like, yeah, we've got this, or this feels like, yeah, we're doing it. Um, because I know in some CPG brands, it's in a certain store, or is it getting in a publication? Yeah. What for you kind of like really cements it? Yeah, I feel like, you know, we wanted, we had a list of publications we wanted to get on. Uh, and we got on like four out of the five that we really wanted to get on, which was, you know, it's very exciting when you see uh, a publication like apartment therapy do a full spread on you and you're like hey this is something i've subscribed to for 20 years and now all of a sudden i get an email and we're there um so that was really cool um and then you know like you know l magazine and a few other canadian magazines that we're in uh, again you know you have friends call you up saying hey i just opened up this magazine and saw your brand uh, that's pretty cool um and then obviously like hitting sales targets right um and getting into like we got into a couple of hotels as well, which was pretty good. They're smaller, but you know, um, you know, those are those are really big for us. So every sort of sale we try to celebrate, and uh, every milestone uh, we celebrate as well. That's really cool. Well, what's coming next for Takasa? What are, what are you guys uh, working hard on now, and and what should we be looking out for? Yeah, we're um, you know we're we're working on a few things in terms of. 
Uh, I think next year will be a big year for us this year. You know, we're growing at about 60% year over year, which is great. Nice. Um, we've added ourselves to a few Canadian marketplaces and now we're starting to look at the U S so um, maybe we will be on a few U S marketplaces and adding our sort of name brand down South um, because mainly we're in Canada. We don't even advertise in the States yet. Um, we still get about 15% of our sales uh, going to the U S um, and that's largely because of SEO and affiliate. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, build up as much as we can up, up North and then, um, take ourselves down South. And I think that's going to be, um, a big part of our scaling for next year. Really cool. Do you, do you ship to, uh, the U S currently? Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. 15 right now, 15% of our sales go to the U S. Awesome. What's the, uh, the logistics like with that? Is that like a, is there like a handoff and carrier? I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know anything you know, about the uh, logistics. Yeah, no. It's actually funny. It's actually cheaper for me to send something from here to Florida than it is for me to send it from here to Toronto. Really? Um, and yeah, we use FedEx uh, for our shipping. And for some reason, it's just uh, more efficient for us to send out to the US. Now, returns are a bigger issue. It's more of a manual process when there's a return um, versus here. It's just like click and they can send it back to us. Um, but um, you know, it's uh, logistically there's no challenges on that side. That's awesome. But we are looking, at, we are looking at a U.S. distribution center just um, in Seattle um, with a partner of ours out there that we can sort of start receiving products there and sending products out from there. Definitely, yeah, I can imagine that would make uh, make life a little bit easier, keeping it all on yeah. one side of the border. Yeah. Well, great. Um, this has been good. I, I think we we touched a lot of uh, uh, different points here, and and I really appreciate you taking some time and and uh, you know sharing with us you know your growth story. So thank you so much for for being here with us. Um, could you take a minute to to tell our customers where they can find you and uh, and uh, what they should expect when they get there? Yeah, absolutely. So well, thank you guys for having me on. Um, this has been great as well, just having these conversations. Um, you can find us at uh, tacasa.co. Um, that's our website. You're going to find a collection of bed and bath linens there. Um, and then you can also find us uh, on Instagram at tacasa.co and uh, Facebook, Takasa Lifestyle. Excellent. Lindsay, would you read us out? So thank you so much, Kuljeet, for giving us insights into Takata. And uh, thank you so much to all those watching and listening to Ecom Marketing with the Pitbulls. Remember to subscribe and get all our podcasts and YouTube videos as soon as they're released. And if you're finding the show valuable, we'd really appreciate a like on YouTube or a review on your favorite podcast player. And we will see you all next time. Hey, it's Andy. I'm here with Percy, the original PPC Pitbull. Thanks for checking us out today. If you're ready to take the next step in your digital marketing journey, come on over to ppcpitbulls.com and book a free strategy session. We'll take a few minutes to get to know you and your brand, and I promise you'll leave with actionable insights that you can implement today. Working together, we're going to get you on the right track towards reaching your unique e-commerce goals.